This is the Mobile Home Park Lawyer Podcast with Fur Neiman. If you're looking to generate wealth and passive income in the lucrative world of mobile home parks, you're in the right place. You'll discover solutions to the common legal and operational pitfalls and how to optimize parks to maximize income. Your host is in the trenches. He's a real estate attorney, financial analyst, and mobile home park investor and operator. Now, let's turn it over to Ferd Neiman. Welcome back, Mobile Home Park Nation. Ferd Neiman here again today with another episode of the Mobile Home Park Lawyer Podcast. My guest today is Charlotte Dunford. Charlotte is a, with a private equity group. They specialize in mobile home parks, uh, owner and operator. And uh, what makes them a little bit special is they'll they'll tackle some of the smaller parks that a lot of operators uh don't really want to chase. So they've got a little bit of a niche there. Uh, please help me welcome my guest, Charlotte Dumford. Charlotte, how are you doing? Doing well. How are you? Good. Well, tell us a little bit more about your background, how you got into this asset class, uh, what you guys do, and we'll go from there. Right. So um, I am in uh, private equity investment, uh, focusing on small to medium level mobile home parks. Uh, how I got into it was I graduated college uh, in 2017, and uh, right after that, I was working a corporate job. On the side, I started investing in um, real estate. Uh, I started with a single family home and to a, uh, a duplex. And shortly after that, I decided that I could pursue real estate full time. And I've always wanted to be um, running my biz- own business and as an entrepreneur. And I was also a firm believer in doing something that m- most people aren't doing. Uh, and I uh, read a lot of uh, books and um, just also a firm believer on the blue ocean strategy and escaping competition. And uh, one of the books that made a really big impact on me was um, From Zero to One by Peter Thiel, who is uh, a Silicon Valley entrepreneur and also the co-founder of PayPal. Um, So he has a strategy of escaping competition and uh, creating a monopoly in a small niche. So that's what inspired uh, me to find something that is not uh, in an extremely heated market. So I was originally going, going to go after multifamily, but not long after I started trying to uh, acquire deals, I found that the entry of barrier uh, was way too high for someone new in the space. So I decided to look for something that was kind of ignored, kind of a niche that not everybody was chasing after. Um, in 2019, when I first started acquiring mobile home parks, it was um, it was it was mobile home park was not as heated. The market was not as heated as it is today, and it is still a niche today, but back then even more so. So that's how I got into it, and I started with one park in August of 2019, second park November 2019, third park December, and then just really 2020 was uh, rapidly growing, and this year also growing as well. Um, so today we have 22 parks and uh, 4.2 million dollars asset under management. Right, you said 22 parks. Correct. Yeah, that's that's great. Yeah, lots. That's obviously that's obviously fast growth. So uh, congratulations on that. And I've I've read that book by Peter Thiel. It's a good one. Um, and I'm a big fan of the Blue Ocean Strategy. I, that's part of the uh, part of what I what, what I went after with practicing law in the mobile home park space. Is not a lot of uh, other people with that expertise. So it's kind of worked out well uh, to go that approach. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as the parks, tell me. Um, how do you guys operate them? And then with smaller parks, obviously a lot of those, you're not going to have a full-time manager in the budget on a particular park because it's just not economical. So how, I guess, how small of a park will you buy? Will you buy something that's two pads or five pads or is a minimum 20 or give us a, give us a little bit more information on that. Yeah. So the smallest park we have uh, is uh, three, three pads and four to four and uh, four lots, but not all of them are, are occupied. So that's as small as, as, as we have it. Um, and, you know, it, the bigger ones go up to 30, uh, 35 and, and higher. So, you know, it is really in that range. Um, so, yeah, so how we operate them, we operate them um, in, in-house. We have our, my business partner is the property manager who everyone, uh, all of our local teams report to. So. Uh, we're kind of the the kind of like the headquarter here uh, in in in, in uh, where we are, but but 
because we're so spread out and so different, so many different states and there are small parks, uh, we don't have a full-time property manager per se, but we do have local teams consisting of contractors, uh, uh, government authorities, uh, city workers, and uh, all kinds of professionals that we've interacted with during due diligence and post acquisition. We have, um, which with whom we um, established a team with, and then the team would be reporting to us, uh, to primarily to my business partner, um, who will be running the op the operational side of things. Okay. No, that's, that's great. I mean, so from a smaller parks, obviously you got to do more on the kind of headquarters supervision and coordination because it's just uh, harder to make the economics work in on, on full-time on-site management. What does the due diligence process look like on a, on a smaller park? How do you guys go about doing that? How, how are you sourcing deals? Right. So first, first of all, the due diligence um, should run uh, we, we have a checklist and a process built in for the due, the due diligence. Um, just because it's a small park doesn't mean that the due diligence is any less than a bigger park. Um, it's pretty much uh, simple. We start with, um, there are two parts, two phases to our due diligence process. The first phase is right after going under contract, actually before you go under contract, certain things that we could verify um, with the county, the city, um, that does not um, does not cost money to, to to order. We're not into that inspection phase immediately yet. At first, we have to verify that the park is has a legal standing, uh, the permit. We have to verify all of the information supplied by the by the seller, um, like all, all the rent roll, all that all of that needs to be um, uh, substantiated by actual deposits in the bank that we have to see, uh, verify the income. We also have to verify the expenses, the bills, uh, tax bills, water bills, utilities, if they're paying for utilities and everything like that. So um, everything needs to be verified first, but when, once the numbers are verified, uh, we'll go into the inspection phase. So we'll have a uh, camera job to, uh, to inspect the utility lines and electricians to check out the electric, uh, the electrical poles, uh, the electrical uh, infrastructure within the park, and also uh, several other uh, inspections. But there, there will be a lot more than that, but some of them include definitely an environmental study is a must do, um, and um, a tree service to inspect the trees and see if there's anything overhanging, causing a health hazard, which we, we, we need to immediately remove becoming a time bomb, taking time bomb uh, as time goes on. So all of those inspections and uh, many more depending on where the park is located. Um, yeah, so that all of that is part of the due diligence process. And as far as how we source our deals, uh, over the time, um, the past uh, pretty much two years of time, we have built uh, multiple relationships with uh, sellers, brokers, and, um, you know, even, you know, uh, I think tenants, and we, we just have a lot of uh, contacts, um, which uh, kind of acts like a lease machine um, system to um, input the lease into our system. So we underwrite all the deals. Um, you know, I, I, I would confidently say that there aren't really that many deals in the small to uh, medium level parks. I wouldn't say they were, they wouldn't be any deals there that we haven't got our uh, hands on and kind of underwritten um, either pass or pursuit. So that's, that's how, how we source our deals. Yeah. And it's it, a lot of deals, you know, we, it's deals, good deals are made, they're not given to us. So there hasn't been one deal we haven't fought, fought for it. Like, you know, at, at the end of closing, we feel like we've, we've just finished a battle because the deals, good deals don't, don't just come by. They're pretty much negotiated and uh, fought for. Yeah, well, it sounds like you have a thorough process in your due diligence and your lead generation. I would imagine that um, there are less buyers in, in your space. It's a competitive asset class in general right now, but on the, the deals that are under under 15 pads, I know we're going to be less competitive, I think, because you know, maybe, maybe, maybe not. Maybe there's some newcomers looking to get deals that are five and eight and 10 units, but a lot of the 
um, more experienced players are not pursuing those. So there's certainly would be a niche. Can you give us a feel as to the, the pricing or cap rate on deals of that size? I mean, because the due diligence you've mentioned seems robust as necessary, but it's as a function of the effort relative to the deal size, it's going to be more effort than a deal that's 100 pads, for example, or you still have to pay for one phase one, you still have to do one site visit. So presumably, in order to make that uh, risk reward or, or effort benefit analysis be suitable, you need to buy at uh, more premium uh, or, or you know discounted pricing, excuse me. Can you give us a feel on what, what kind of cap rates are you getting on these deals of smaller sizes? And what, and what states or geographic footprint are you guys in? Yeah, that's that's exactly right. Um, I think so. Like you said, the risk reward needs to need to play out because they're so you know they're, they're, they're the cost expense ratio will be a little bit higher because they're they're smaller. Um, that's why we we have to get a cap rate at um, at least eight point five percent, eight percent and above. So that's you know in in twenty twenty when we acquired a lot of deals and this year as well we we pretty much exclusively only acquired at ten percent and above. So this kind of cap rate. So because it's small, because it's in a niche, because it doesn't have as much competition, that makes the pricing extremely uh, extremely attractive. That needs to be part of the deal. If not, what's the point, right? So um, the deal needs to be extremely sweet, meaning that the cap rate needs to be at least ten point. A ten percent and above to make make the make sense of the deal, and that's you know continues to be our strategy um, for small to medium level parks is that they, they are at a really attractive cap rate. And as far as geographically, we have uh, we're primarily focused on uh, most of landlord friendly states uh, in the southeast and some uh, pretty big presence in the um, Midwest. Um, and, uh, you know, a, a few states that we're trying to get more into, we have uh, one in the Northeast and in, in Maine, but we're, we're trying to get, get more into that. We're pretty much, pretty much put an anchor in those, some of those states and try to grow more into it. But we have a rather large uh, presence in the uh, Midwest and Southeast as, as of now. Okay. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. You need to get premium, premium pricing now. Are you guys tackling deals with private utility systems as well, um, or are you only looking at city water, city sewer? We're 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 uh, pretty much exclusively looking at city water, and as far as sewer system, septic tanks are fine depending on when they were last serviced and they're 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 how 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 good they are, but uh, definitely not uh, private. But 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 mostly focusing on public utilities. Yes. Okay. Got it. Now, tell me how your investors work. I mean, because if, if you've got smaller deal sizes from a lot count, you're presumably they're smaller deal sizes on a dollar volume. So how, how small of an increments do you take on investors? Are you only taking on accredited investors or are you taking, is it friends and family or um, how are you guys raising capital for all these projects? Well, 90% of our investors are accredited investors. And, um, uh, so as far as raising money goes, our, our, our raise goal that, uh, you know, could be anywhere from 100,000 to, you know, the biggest one we've raised is 700,000. So um, I think uh, how, how, how it works is that uh, pro, uh, the minimum investment we ask for in, in, in a small deal is probably 20, is, is actually $25,000. And for a bigger deal, we're probably going to 50,000. And uh, for some of our investors, they would like to contribute a, a bigger chunk. So maybe they would contribute, you know, 80% or 70%. It depends on what it is, which deal it is, uh, the majority of the equity, and then um, the, the rest would um, invest 25,000 to 50K and sometimes 100K. So it just depends on the deal. But uh, our deal, our raise goals are relatively small uh, because the deals are smaller. So anywhere from 100,000 to um, 600, 700,000 is that would be our range. And, um, you know, usually doesn't take that many investors to, to take, up, take down deals. So our investors, um, our deals sell, sell, sell out pretty quickly uh, once we, we send out the offering. That's great. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Now, what about bank financing? I know historically, you know, smaller loans have been harder to get financed. Are you guys able to get, bank loans on these or are you mostly doing seller finance or buying them cash we're mostly doing seller financing and buying them cash uh but uh i have sold a mobile home park of mine 
um, that the buyer was is, is a rather small deal. Um, the sales price only 134k as uh, is, is my personal park, and the buyer have obtained uh, bank financing no problem, and the loan has was improved uh, was approved. And some of the one of the parks were were, were in the exit process right now. Um, has no, also has no problem with the bank financing. But as far as how we are acquiring them uh, for the speed that we're going at it, and then the the, the equity that we have, uh, we're, we're most mostly getting them as seller financing and um, you know uh, full cash uh, equity purchase. However, as we go into 2022 and we have some of the slightly bigger deals right now, um, we, we we're looking at uh, bank financing options as well. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've been able to get loans on smaller deals, but I know in general, it's just tougher. I've, it, it seems like a lot more of the smaller deals are going to be seller finance um, for mm-hmm. banks. I've had a bank tell me, look, it's a $200,000 loan. It's just as much loan balance as a $200,000 house, but it's a heck of a lot more work and, un- and lack of familiar- familiarity and therefore risk for the mm-hmm. lender to, you know, evaluate and underwrite a mobile home park for 200,000 versus just another, you know, moderate single, single family house. So they, mm-hmm. that's where the push has kind of been um, that I've seen a lot is unless, unless you've already got a banking relationship or there's some expectation that you're going to do a lot of volume over time, then um, that, that has been a little bit of a hurdle. Right, right, and that that creates an opportunity for acquisitions, because if 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 if, if the banks are being reluctant to offer you a loan or approve a loan for of the size, that means uh, the sellers are might be more motivated to do seller financing, which would give you some leverage and increases your speed. And if you were to do a cash offer, that would give you a premium pricing. So all of that plays into the strategy. Yeah, certainly. I think it's going to make it um, easier on the acquisition side. I think it, there's some risk on the exit that um, who are you going to sell to? I, I had that happen on a project one time where it's like, okay, I got in good on the buy, but it's like, oh, wait, now I got a park, small park in a blue state with a lagoon and there were less buyers in the back end. Um, so it, it hurt me on the, on the back end. Now, if I was going to hold it forever, then it'd be less, probably less relevant, but that was uh, something I learned on, you know, on, when you got a niche property like that is you can get it for a reasonable price. I think I bought it at a 15 cap. But then when I eventually sold it, I had to sell it for like a 10. I didn't get to sell it for a six or seven. Um, so that was just, that was three years ago. The market's compressed. So maybe today it is a, an eight, but it's still probably not going to be a, a six on the sales side, but. Yeah, yeah. So when we underwrite deals, it's always 10% cap exit. We never underwrite a six cap because we, we understand the niche that we're in and it's just not really realistic to, to expect uh, a six cap when we exit. Um, so mostly it's going to be a higher cap rate and that's all built into the numbers. So if the numbers work like that, then it, it will be fine. And, you know, we have kind of, you know, it, it's it's been proven by by some of the access that we're going through and the park we already sold. So as long as your underwriting is not conservative and numbers work, um, you, you'll be fine. And of course, anything on a lagoon, it, it would be a difficult, difficult sale for sure. Yeah, I mean, lagoons are obviously another hurdle. Um, I've, you know, you still see them out there and, still, and they still trade in the marketplace. You just got to obviously underwrite a right. little, uh, a little more conservative cap rate on the on the refinance and the exit and i mean obviously you got to increase your opex because you got more testing and oversight and maintenance for that than you would city sewer but um no it's definitely sounds like you guys are on top of it charlotte what else should we know about you or what other tips or tricks do you have or maybe fun stories you've got for our audience and from your experience right i think um well uh, as far as tricks, um, there's, um, I mean, every, in, in every single niche, they have, um, um, you know, th- there are different ways to operate. But for, for us, um, I think what we're trying to do in 2022, as 2021 is, prob- is, is closing in, in, in one, one, one month or so, um, is that we want to, um, we're, we're, we're growing rapidly and we have a lot of new deals down the pipeline. So if any of you guys uh, listening would be interested, uh, I would love to connect with you and chat with you on the phone. Um, you can reach me uh, at our website at johnscreekcapital.com. 
dot com, and uh, we'll start from there. I'll be uh, very interested in chat with you. All right. Well, great, Charlotte. Uh, appreciate you coming on the show, getting to know you a little bit better, and uh, continued best of luck and success in your guys' business endeavors. Thank you so much. Thanks right. for having me. You're welcome. Take care. You've been listening to the Mobile Home Park Lawyer Podcast with Ferd Neiman. Ready to learn more? Go to www.themobilehomelawyer.com for free resources and materials to help you succeed. If you love the podcast, go to Apple Podcasts, give us your review, and subscribe today. Thank you for listening. Neither the Supreme Court of Missouri nor the Missouri Bar reviews nor approves certifying organizations or specialist designations. The choice of a lawyer is an important decision and should not be based solely upon advertisements.